we come to a very familiar passage uh, in Matthew 18. Uh, it's a familiar passage, it's one that we've heard before, so I'm going to approach the passage just slightly different from simply preaching its content. Uh, I want to preach its intent and not necessarily its content. I want to preach its intent without ignoring, though, its content. I want to show you how its content leads to its intent. Uh, the shift has already happened. I don't know if you're aware of it. It, it's, uh, it, was a, it was a subtle shift, but it was a shift nonetheless. Within the general Christian population, there has been a shift from our center, which is Christ, to humanity. We have moved from being Christ-centered to being man-centered. And that shift is no more evident in the body of Christ when it comes to talking about forgiveness. Let me show you what I mean. You've, I've heard it outside of church, inside of church, from the pulpit, from the pew, when we want to convince a believer, a Christian, or anyone why they should forgive, the motivation for forgiving, what do most of the time we refer to? Y'all help me. When we want somebody to forgive, we tell them forgiveness is not for you. It's, it may not for the other person. It's really for you, right? The best argument that we've heard. When you forgive someone, you are set free. When you don't forgive someone, they are free, but you are held in bondage to your lack of forgiveness. So what we end up trying to do is to forgive someone else so that I can benefit. But that's so unbiblical, so not Christ-centered. It's such a bad paradigm to choose to forgive somebody from. When the Bible talks about forgiveness, it always keeps forgiveness Christ-centered. I want to turn your attention to Matthew 18. And in order for you to see Matthew's intent, I've got to give you sort of a broad picture of what you're going to see. Beginning at verse number 15 of Matthew 18, Matthew is going to tell us about Jesus' teaching about forgiving your brother. Now, you, you've got to sort of understand sort of the broad picture in order to see this. It sounds like Jesus is going to say, if your brother sins, or if you see your brother sinning, right? But I think the context suggests when your brother sins against you. Now, I got to prove that to you, right? Because y'all don't take my word for it, right? Matthew 15, 18, 15 begins with, if your brother sins, now sometimes your Bible will have helps. Anybody's Bible have a note next to if your brother sins? Yours has a note. What does the note say? It says, uh, late manuscripts added against you. Right. Y'all hear that? In other words, some later copies of the scripture, not some of the earlier ones, read, if your brother sins against you. Right? Your Bible says that. Right? Now, here's why I think that is likely the setting, even though it might not be actually written in the original. Let me show you why. Jesus is going to say, if your brother sins, and then he's going to tell you the process that you go through if your brother sins. If your brother sins, then you go to him privately, right? And if your brother listens to you, he says, you've won your brother. The language suggests the relationship is restored. Y'all hear it? You've won your brother, right? And he says, if your brother does not listen to you, then you go get two or three, uh, two or three others, and the two or three of you approach your brother. And if he refuses to listen to them, Jesus is going to say, then you tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen, Jesus says, even to the church, suggesting, you know, he really ought to listen to the whole congregation, right? If he refuses to listen to even the church, then you treat him as the tax collector and the Gentile, right? But listen, that's not where the story finishes. It says, then in response to Jesus is 
talk about forgiving your brother because forgiveness is not on the table. It's implied. It's implied that if your brother sins against you and, and you go to him and he listens, then you forgive him and you've won your brother. Peter hears the implied forgiveness in what Jesus says, and he has a question. Okay, I should forgive. And then Peter's question, beginning at verse number 21, is how often shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Y'all see it? Peter's question comes from what Jesus has just said about your brother and if he sins implied against you. Y'all see it? So here is the, here's the structure of the sermon. Jesus talks about forgiveness and how you approach the forgiveness of your brother. Peter then says, okay, I get it, but how often do I do that if he sins against me? Because surely, Lord, there's got to be a limit to how often I forgive my brother, right? And then G Peter throws out this magnanimous gesture in his thinking. He says, seven times? Because surely that ought to be enough. And then Jesus is going to respond, get this, not with a Peter you ought to forgive because it's good for you, right? He is going to give what I think Matthew is intending to communicate, right, about the nature of forgiveness, all right? See, one of the things we cannot get a hold of, uh, Gilbert, is this idea of forgiveness. When I don't feel it, how do I forgive somebody when I'm really still angry with them. They have really offended me. It's a real offense, right? And the world, the culture has told us, then turn the tables on them, right? Give them your forgiveness, put them in the bondage, and you set yourself free, right? But here's what Jesus is going to respond with. Jesus is going to respond with a what is the kingdom-like story. Y'all with me? That's the important part about this. Forgiveness is not rooted in you. It's rooted in the nature of the kingdom that you will inherit because of Jesus. Are y'all with me? That's the first thing y'all really need to get. Forgiveness is not rooted in you or your ability to forgive. It's rooted in the nature of the kingdom of God that you and I will inherit because of Jesus. Are y'all with me? So then he tells him a kingdom story. But listen, I, I want to go back now at the beginning of verse 15, where the story starts, to fill it out for us a little bit more so we'll understand the nature then of the kingdom, right? Because you'll never get forgiveness if you don't know at a level deep enough to affect your emotions the nature of the kingdom. Let, let me say that again because that's so important. You will never grasp forgiveness the way God intended if you stay at the shallow level of what's in it for me. You've got to go deeper into an understanding of what God is doing so that forgiveness will reach you at an emotional depth that you'll be able to do what is only divinely possible, which is to forgive somebody who has sinned against you. Are y'all with me? So let's go back. Verse 15. Here's how the story unfolds. The first thing I want you to notice is Jesus says, if your brother sins. Right? This is not just some Joe Blow on the street in Jesus' story. This is he's, him talking to his disciples, and he says, if your brother sins. Now, the question you've got to ask is, for the disciples, who's their brother? Right? Implied in the if your brother sins is this is a within the body of Christ context. You with me? This is a family issue. If your brother in Christ sins against you, you all with me? It's important to understand that because within the body we have a we have a, a, a central connection to each other that's in Christ that makes this kind of forgiveness possible. Are you with me? Now, I want you to see, this is really important because we, 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 we just don't get this. Jesus suggests in how you deal with your brother who sins against you is an intention to keep it private initially. Listen to what he says. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. 
Now, some of your Bibles may not say in private. It, it may say between you and him alone. But you get the it, between you and him alone suggests this doesn't have to get out. You got an issue with a brother in Christ. Your first responsibility is to go to your brother alone. Right. And here's what he says. If he listens to you while y'all are alone, you have won your brother. Relationship restored, held intact. Y'all get it? And then he says, but if he does not listen to you, because y'all know human nature, the tendency to make excuses is always there and he does not listen to you. He says, then you go out and you get two or three more, one or two more. Actually, the passage says, right? So that between you and the one or two more, you may have two or three. Right? If he refuses to listen to them, that's the two or three, right? Tell it then to the church or the congregation. See, our problem is we start at the outside and work our way in. Something happens to me, I start telling you, right, about what happened to me with some brother in private. Don't start with the congregation. That's the last resort. Are y'all with me? And he says, and if he refuses to listen even to the church. Y'all hear, there is an implied pressure put on the brother who sinned against you. Y'all hear the implied pressure? If you don't listen and repent of the sin you've committed against me, you know this is going further than this, don't you? Y'all hear it? There's an implied pressure there. Listen, it ought to be an implied pressure, but the implied pressure is not a you're about to gossip about me, but the body of Christ that's always full of grace is about to know. And I also know that all it takes is for me to listen, and the church knows once I listen, all's forgotten. We've won our brother back. There's no lingering effects of the forgiveness. Y'all with me? If he does not listen, then he says, let him be to you as some of your Bibles say, a Gentile and a tax collector. Literally, it is the Gentile and the tax collector. And we know how they treated those two in the Jewish context in the first century. Right. And then he says, here's also a difficult passage of scripture. Truly, I say to you, what, whatever you have, whatever you bind on earth, get this. It's the, 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 the tense of the verse, the verb you're about to hear is the past, uh, future perfect passive. Let me say that again. The future perfect passive. Some of your Bibles may read as if it's the future tense. Some of your Bibles may say, whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. But it's actually the future perfect tense. It is whatever we bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Right? Difficult passage. You know, so, some people can't get this idea of binding and loosing spirits and all that kind of stuff from this passage. That's obviously not in the context. All right? Okay, here is the process of forgiving your brother. Right? If you forgive, if you forgive him, if he follows, right, you have loosed him from all obligations to pay you back. If he refuses, you have bound him. And whatever you bind or loose will have already been bound or loosed in heaven. Are y'all with me? So that in the context, the binding and loosing is heaven is going to testify to the decisions that you have made because heaven has already given you how to handle it. Are y'all with me? In other words, now, now watch this. That's for all of the rest of the folk who may not understand the process. Let me show you why I say that. He says, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my father who is in heaven. Now, in that context, who's the two or three? I'm going to say something. Who's the two or three? Witnesses. The witnesses to what? The what? The argument. Not the argument, but the the offense. Are y'all with me? It's not two or three people deciding they want something from God. Y'all see that? That's not the context. That's not where two or three are touching and agreeing. God's going to give us what we want. Y'all see that, right? 
The two or three in the context are the two or three who went to the brother to to talk with the brother about the sin he has committed against one of that two or three. Y'all following? All right. He says, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, where have these two or three, for what reason have these two or three gathered? Come on, say something. To discuss, to discuss the offense, right? Jesus says, there I am in the midst. Y'all get it? So listen, if you are the congregation and y'all have just been brought by these two or three, this accusation against this brother who has sinned against the one, right? And you say, well, we can't treat him like a tax collector and a sinner. That's just so harsh. What, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Jesus has just told you what he would do. Did y'all hear it? What did he say he'd do? He'd be in the midst of who? No, not the discussion. He said, I'm in the midst of the, the two or three. Y'all get it? The congregation. What did you decide? Jesus says, I'm voting with the two or three. Y'all get it? I'm with them. Where are you going to stand? Y'all get it? Because y'all know how church folk are. We get overly sentimental. That's not what Jesus would do. That's just so harsh. Jesus would be forgiving. Jesus says, where the two or three are gathered, that's where I am. Y'all get it? And so Peter has just heard something. What has he just heard? If the brother repents, if he, in the context, listens to either the person, the two or three, or the congregation, what has just happened? You've won your brother, which is another way of saying you must forgive him. Right? You must forgive. The winning of the brother back suggests all is, all is, all is washed away now. No, no more need for anything on your brother's part to get back into your good graces. You've won your brother. And Peter has heard it. Right? That's the standard. And then Peter says, well, Lord, how often? Now, y'all need to get this. The question is not whether I should. It's how often. Should I do that? Okay, my brother sins against me once. I go through the process. Just before we get to the church, he, he repents. He listens. He says, I'm sorry. That's an offense I should not have done against you. I've won my brother back. He goes the next day and he does the exact same thing. And he won't listen to me. But then when I get to two or three, he says, okay, you're right. That's a sin. I'm sorry. And then the next day he does the same thing to me again. Right? And he says to Jesus, how often? Because, you know, seven's probably good enough. Y'all with me? Now, here, here's, the, here's what, what becomes interesting. It would sound like seven is reasonable, doesn't it? Okay, then he, he's really unrepentant. We can conclude after the seventh time, he really does not mean it. And I can stop there. Because his intentions, his, his behavior shows that his heart is not right. That's reasonable, isn't it? And so Jesus is going to answer the how often question with the means of reaching the place of forgiveness the way the kingdom suggests you should. That's the important part. Peter says that Peter came, verse 21, and said to him, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother? Uh, my, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times and Jesus says I do not say to you seven times but up to seventy times seven and it's a good thing Jesus didn't stop there or we'd all keep count we would say 490 that's the last one and you're at 489 <laughs> he said but he does not stop there he finishes with a story for this reason, he says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts. Now, now why, li listen to this. He says, for this reason, this discussion reason, we can compare the kingdom to the question you have just asked me. Let's put your question in a kingdom of heaven context, he says. Did y'all get it? Is it a parable? It's not a parable. It's a story. 
It's a story to, to illuminate the meaning. Remember, we talked about what a parable was for, right? What was a parable for? Was it to illuminate the meaning? It was not. A parable was to hide the meaning from those who had seen enough revelation to not get it. So it's different. This, the meaning, the answer to this story is obvious, right? The meaning of the parable leaves you going, I don't get it, right? So he says, here's the story. Listen to the story. Because in the story is the nature of the kingdom of God that I'm still quite convinced the average believer has not reached a, le a, a depth of reflection upon so that it changes us inherently. Watch this. When the king, verse 24 says, began to settle his accounts, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. You got to know what the, what the amount of money means because so much of the truth is in how much he owed the king. Did your Bible have a note next to the 10,000 talents? Anybody? Yes, it says millions of dollars. It says millions of dollars. It's probably more than that. Anybody Bible have a note? Yes. What does it say? Millions of dollars. Anybody else Bible have a note? More literal note? Wages of that's, that's what it literally means. Get, so, so, so follow Jesus' story. It's not a, it's not a, a, a true story. It's, it's Jesus' story about the kingdom to illuminate how often I should forgive to Peter. He says, a, a slave owed his king 10,000 times 15 years worth of pay. Y'all get it? If one talent was 15 years worth of pay for the average slave, when Jesus said 10,000 talents, what number did he just give? He just said the slave owed the king 150,000 years worth of pay. Is my math right? It is, isn't it? 10,000 at 15 years. He has just said what is obviously hyperbole to make a point. Because there's no way a slave, say he's 30, 40 years old, could have owed the king 150,000 years worth of pay. Why the exaggeration of the number? To communicate, he can't pay. Y'all with me? He owes him 150,000 years worth of pay. But since he did not have the means to repay, well, duh. His Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Y'all get Jesus' story? Jesus says, you can't pay, but you're going to pay. And you will stay in prison until you do repay. How long is he going to be there? At least 150,000 years. But, but listen to what Jesus does in the story. So the slave fell to the ground and he prostrated himself before him, saying, have patience with me. And I will repay you everything. Now, does that sound ironic to anybody? Yes. What, what's ironic about it? <laughs> but he's asking for time. Just give me a, a, a few more years, and I'll come up with the 150,000 years worth of money I owe you. Now, see, Jesus is telling such a great story. Because there's something in the heart of the slave who knows he owes more than he can pay, but will ask for time to pay what he cannot pay. He's talking about the kingdom though, right? So stay with me. He's asking to do what he cannot do. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion. Now where's the compassion come from? 
It, do, it obviously does not come from the slave. He doesn't look and say, you know, you are worth so much to me, slave, that I'm going to have compassion on you. You, you get it? Because the slave undoubtedly looks so pitiful to the king. I mean, really, if you are the employer and your employee has been taking advances on his paycheck, all right, and he now owes you 150,000 years worth of his salary, and he says to you, give me a year or two and I'll get it back to you. What do you think of him? But, the, but he says, the Lord of that slave felt compassion. And, and watch this, nature of the kingdom. And released him and forgave him the debt. He did not put him on a payment plan. Y'all see it? He didn't reduce the debt to what he could handle. Y'all see that? He didn't say, well, you'll only live another 10 years. You'll just be in my service for 10 years. He forgave him the debt. He says, all 150,000 years wiped clean. Y'all get it? Here's what you got to get. That's the nature of the kingdom. You see, what, why most people, Jake, struggle with forgiveness is they don't get that part of the kingdom. They literally don't get it. You ask the average person who goes to church regularly, right, does God wipe away all of my sins so that no matter what, I will never have to pay for a single sin the rest of my days? They'll say, yes, but you can't abuse it. Won't they say that, Jake? They'll say, that's right, but you still have to and fill in the blank, won't they? Sure they will. And any but after the you don't have to pay is a payment plan. Y'all get it? It's a payment plan. It's a you still owe me. I'm still going to get something from you. He says... Verse 28, this is where the story takes on a different turn. This is where Peter's question actually gets addressed, right? But that slave went out and found, the, 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 the went out and found suggests he went out to find, right? He didn't stumble upon, he went out and found his fellow slave who owed him a hundred denarii. What's the note by the hundred denarii? A few dollars. It's probably more than a few dollars. A hundred den uh, one denarii is one day's pay for the average slave. Right? Because Jesus is not minimizing the offense. Listen, a hundred days worth of pay is about a, three and a half months worth of your salary. I'm sorry, I'll fight you over three and a half months of my salary you owe me. Now, three and a half months, we got to deal with you. This is a serious offense. Y'all get it? Jesus is not minimizing the offense done to the brother. Right? He didn't say, well, he owes you a measly two or three dollars. He owes you enough to have hurt you. Because if you owe me three and a half months worth of pay, you will hurt me. Or hurt most people. Am I right? That's about three and a half months worth of pay. But listen, it can be repaid, can't it? That's important. But look at what the slave who had been forgiven does. Look at what he does. Jesus says, in Jesus' own story, because he can tell it the way he wants. He says, he seizes him. Because, Jake, that's what you do when folk owe you. <laughs> he put his hands on him. And where did he put his hands? Yeah, because that's the only place you can choke somebody. <laughs> and he seized him, and he began to choke him. I've seen this growing up in my neighborhood when they owe you money. He said, pay me what you owe me. It's threatening, isn't he? It's a threat, isn't it? The, the, the hands around the neck says, because I mean business. This debt's not going anywhere. You better pay me what you owe. 
It's, he's putting the fear of God in him, isn't he? He chokes him. Because you got to get their attention because you know people don't think you're serious. So when you lay hands on his throat, he knows you mean business. I want to be repaid. But keep in mind something. In the story, the how much you owe is really about how often you must forgive. And so in Jesus' story, don't lose this. You sin against me again. Do that to me one more time. Y'all get it? That was your last time doing that to me. It says, so his fellow slave fell to the ground. Sound familiar? And began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. Now, here's the great part of the story. If the slave, the first slave was patient, he could repay. Couldn't he? I mean, it would have taken some work on the second slave's part. But listen, you can repay a three month debt. And because it's Jesus' story and Jesus really does know the heart of man, he tells it just the way he intends to, to get at the heart when he says, but he was unwilling. Listen, for most of us, we don't think we're capable of forgiveness. You say, I'm trying, but it's just so hard, I can't. I just can't seem to forget. And Jesus says, no, you are unwilling. What makes him unwilling? What makes him unwilling? What, what, what takes it out of the realm of, of, of capability and puts it in the arena of unwillingness. You are able, but you just don't want to. But why would his, he thinks he can't. He thinks there's something wrong with my heart. I can't get it into my heart to forgive. What makes it not an issue of ability, but the will? The answer is in the story. When you have been forgiven, you have now enough, how do I say that? You have been freed from enough responsibility and stress to pay that you don't have to stress someone else to pay. You, something has happened to you already that has put you in the place now where you can do on a smaller scale what someone has done for you. Let me, let me, let me say a little bit differently. Well, let's just say you happen to be walking down the street and you're, you're distressed about your financial situation and someone just happens to see your, your downcast face and says to you, what's the matter? And you tell them your, your long sob story about your need for money and they say, well, guess what? I will pay all of your debt for you. Well, how do I pay you back? You don't have to. I'll just wipe the slate. I will pay all of your debts off. And then you leave and you find a guy now who is in one of your rental properties. And he's a month late on his rent. Right? What now do you do about the guy who's a month behind? Do you lay siege to him? Say, pay me that back month's rent. But see, here's why it's ability, it's, it's, it's will and not ability. All the stress that you felt that you had to get from him is now gone. Listen, why do you have to get that one month's rent now when all of your debts have been paid? What makes it necessary for you to get from him now that one month's rent? Nothing. You don't need it now, do you? You don't have to have it. Your lights are not going to get cut off if he doesn't pay. Your own rent will not go unpaid if he does not pay. And because you're so thrilled to have had your own debts wiped clean, listen to Jesus' words. And he went out and he threw him into prison until he should pay. So when his fellow slaves, those are the brothers, by the way, that's the rest of us. 
right? When the fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved. Why would they be grieved? Why would they be grieved? Because of what they saw. Is that, what, what about that makes it grievous? Because listen, um, in, in most cultures, in most circumstances, situations, if somebody owes the other guy money and he really needs it, there's nothing grievous about that, the guy trying to get paid. You, you know what I mean? Listen, if, if at my job, Q, besides they're not going to pay me one week, the rest of the employees are not going to be grieved if I take somebody by the neck and say, you better give me my paycheck. <laughs> Yo, you with me? Nobody else at the job is going to go, ooh, that's really ugly of Trevor to do that. Are they? But listen, if I have, if I have just hit the lottery, and I'm now a millionaire, and I don't need the paycheck. And the guy I'm choking is not responsible for my check being gone. And they see me choking this guy over my measly check. They're going to look and say, well, that's kind of ugly, isn't it? Listen, how many, how many Christian people look at unforgiveness with grief? Or how many of us say, yeah, I'd do the same thing if you did that to me. They were grieved, he said, deeply grieved. And they came and they reported uh, to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And listen to Jesus' question. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave? You see, that's the, that's the heart question. The heart question is, why doesn't the forgiveness come out of you, having been forgiven so much? See, quit, Peter's question is, how often? And, and Jesus' answer is directly proportional to how much you have been forgiven. Now, having been forgiven so much, why doesn't it come forward? Why doesn't it spill over? Shouldn't you ought to have forgiven your brother? Must be something going terribly wrong inside of you that it does not come out. See, um, you, know, you know, being a pastor, I do a lot of counseling. And uh, forgiveness is always an issue in counseling. Because counseling is really about relationships. Am I right? Y'all know what is the bedrock, uh, bedrock of any relationship? Forgiveness. So-and-so did this against me, Pastor, and I'm not sure I can get over it, right? And they come to counseling because they want to find out how much can they legally put this other person through to feel better about what has happened. And I, and I dealt right at the heart of the issue. The issue is not what he did because he's a sinner, and I know that, and sinners do what sinners do, and that's sin, right? But what I'm trying to get is the only way the relationship is going to be repaired is through what? That's the only way it's going to work, okay? He's injured you. Now what are you going to do? They won't be justified, right? They want to be able to punish or send the other person away and have the rest of the body of Christ be okay with it. That's what they want. And then they get mad at me because I go right to the heart of the issue. Are you going to forgive or not? If you're not, give them the blade. Cut them loose. You can't forgive, relationship's over. Really, that's the end of the subject. If you cannot forgive, the relationship is done. Because if you stay in it and punish, it's over. If you cannot forgive and you don't want to stay in it and punish, then let them go. But the issue is your heart now. And, then, and, I, have, and I have very little... And I think I'm right about it. I have very little uh, compassion for the person who says, I can't. Can't get beyond it. You know why? Because I know the nature of the kingdom. I'm saying, wait a minute, what do you mean you can't? You have been forgiven all of your sin by the Lord. You stand justified by grace. You have sinned against your spouse and y'all made it somehow. 
Don't tell me you haven't. God told me you did. You sinned. You've grieved the spirit of God. And at this moment, you say, I'm not going to anymore. But he's always done that to me. She's always done that to me. You mean you're asking me how often should you forgive? And we go to the text. And, I'm, and at the end of it, I say, so why don't it just come from you? What's the answer? This is a, this is a, this is a complex issue, in, even in Jesus' story. Then what do we say about the nature of the slave who had been forgiven? All. If you are a believer in Christ who cannot forgive, what do we say about you? Now, there's a question for you, isn't it? In Jesus' story, what does the king say about the slave? He said, you wicked slave. He said, you awful person. No, 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 I'm not awful, I'm the victim. Don't turn this on me, he did the sin. He committed the sin, she did the act. And the king is saying, you wicked slave. What makes the slave wicked? You were in the exact same shoes as the guy who has sinned again. You were right there, and what you had done far exceeded what he did to you. And you got forgiveness from me. So why doesn't it come out of you? And he says, and his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all, look at the all there, all that was owed him. You, you, you see, there's, there's two major marks of the body of Christ. Y'all know what they are? What's the biggest one? Anybody tell me? Obvious markers of believers in Christ. What is it? That's the second one. What's the first one? We love one another. That's obvious, right? Jesus says, that, you will, that world will know you're my followers because you, you love each other. And then he says, and you won't even be forgiven of my father if you don't forgive each other. You have no claim to Christianity if you're unforgiving. That one's not tolerated. Why? It's at the very heart of our proclamation, it's at the very heart of the kingdom of God. That, that is the ultimate betrayal of God as a witness for him to be unforgiving. His whole nature and character is to be a forgiver and to forgive you and then say, now go and do likewise. And then he finishes his story to Peter. To answer his question, my heavenly father will also do the same to you. And it, now, now watch him get specific. If each of you does not forgive his brother, what's the words? From the heart. See, they, they'll tell you in church, April, you know, fake it till you can make it. <laughs> Be nice, nasty. I can, I can love them, but I don't like them. Hey, how you doing, Jake? Because, <laughs> you know, Chrissy, because forgiveness is a process. That's what they always tell me. Right now, not yet. It's a process. You know, what would have happened if you came to the Lord for forgiveness of your sins and he says, okay, not now, maybe later, because I'm working through it. <laughs> I'm working through forgiving you because you know what you did really did hurt me. You know those nails, they really were hard. I mean, they hurt. You know, I heard what you said when I was walking by carrying my cross. I'm working on forgiving you for it. <laughs> it's a process. He says, that's what your father will do to each one of you if each of you does not forgive 
from the heart. He said, make it count, make it real. From the heart. Because everybody in the body of Christ shares that one central act from God. We have been forgiven much. We have all been forgiven what we cannot pay. So the question is, then do we make others pay? Do we make them pay what they probably could pay, having been forgiven what we cannot pay? You know, um, how many of you have ever seen the movie uh, Miracle on the River Kwai? It's a classic. Anybody, anybody ever seen it? You've seen it? Great movie, by the way. Uh, is it Bridge on the, Mir on the River Kwai? Bridge on the River Kwai. Um, th these, um, these American soldiers are prisoners of war uh, in, a, in a Japanese camp. And their responsibility is to build this bridge so that the train can go across the River Kwai. Am I right so far? Yeah. Right? Now, this camp, this, this camp is becoming, it's, it's deteriorating, it's become a brutal place. Right? And, and in the movie, uh, the soldiers, they're, they're, they're responding to the brutality around them. You know, there's a lot of infighting and things going on that's, you know, just indicative of human nature and where it goes in those kind of conditions, deteriorating, right? And in the movie, uh, there's this one time where, you know, because they're, they're building this bridge, and so the, the camp is really having to move further and further out. And so when they go out, work on the bridge, right, they have to then gather up their supplies and then come back. Well, when they gather up all the supplies, this one time they come back, a shovel is missing, all right? And so the, one of the guards is, you know, he's livid that somebody has stolen a shovel. So he thinks. And so he lines up all the prisoners and he says, whoever stole the shovel must come forward, and if no one comes forward, everybody dies. Right? And they know he means business. He's a cruel guy. Right? And you know, you know, he's, time is going by and everybody is sweating it and they know, you know, I didn't steal it, but I don't want to die for stealing it. But if the guy who did not steal it does not come forward, we're going to all die. And so this sort of hatred is brewing for the guy next to him because you don't know if he's the guy who stole it and is going to let all of us die, right? And then all of a sudden, one guy steps forward, right? And the, and the guard beats him to death in front of everybody. Doesn't shoot him. He beats him to death in front of everybody, right? And then the next morning, Christy, they count their tools, they gather up their tools to go out and work on the bridge again. And it's found that the shovel was never missing. They miscounted. And the guy did not steal it, but he came forward so that everybody else wouldn't die. <laughs> and it was, it was incredible what happened to all the prisoners then. Right? Now they are brothers because somebody has given his life for them. All of the anger and the brutality that was a part of this prison camp is now melted away because now they know we have one solid connection and that is we live because one died. And now they're brothers. The rest of the movie is about the camaraderie that builds within the camp. Same thing happened with Jesus. Listen, you don't hold petty arguments against your brother when somebody has died that all of us may live. We have that in common now. That's the heart of the Christian message. That's what makes us brothers. And listen, the moment we think we're justified or we don't listen and we justify our behavior, we lose the justification that we received from the one dying. I'm not just because I did not sin against you. I'm just because he died for my sins. Do y'all get it? And so you don't get justice from your brother by making them pay either. 
Your justice comes from the death of the one who died. So we don't make them pay. <clears throat> That's one you're going to have to reflect on. Let me give you a few things that will help you about the nature of the kingdom. Don't let anybody fool you. Christianity, church, is not about human behavior. Christianity, historically, has never been about how good you act. Because the Bible is clear, none of us act good enough. So now that we are saved, it never becomes about how good we act. Listen, I'm not giving you reason to act bad. You're already doing that. I'm not giving you license to go out and behave badly with people. You've already done that. You're already doing that. You will do that. That's a given, and we know it's true because God told us so. If I'm not giving you permission to sin against your brother, you've already done that. But it is true that at the heart of Christianity is you have been forgiven of all your offenses. Not only to your brother, but to God. All of them wiped clean by the blood. Jesus paid it all. You will repay nothing. That grand gesture ought to change you. But as long as, guess this, this is the important point. As long as you have latent somewhere in your hearts that I have been forgiven, but am justified to get from others who have offended me, you have not embraced how much you've been forgiven. You have not embraced that. And here's the great thing about it. Until you embrace Jesus as the one who paid it all, you have not crossed over from death to life. Yes, you can't trust any part of your effort and be saved. It's by Christ alone. You can't in any way be holding back a measure of your own efforts for your righteousness. That's what justification is like. If you own any of your salvation, Paul says, you'll boast about it. And you'll boast, and because you boast, you require a nickel from everybody else. If you don't see their nickel's worth of effort, they're unjustified. And so what did Jesus say? I paid it all. Lest any man, Scripture says, should boast. So that the forgiveness ought to come naturally from you. Amen.